Hello everybody and welcome to my channel. This is Jose Rodriguez, a viewer. In fact, a couple of viewers asked me, is there anything in your channel? And I have over 1,100 videos, well over 1,100 videos now. Anything pertaining to just editing in Adobe Lightroom and using the Pro 100 Canon printer to print the edited images on. And I thought, I actually do, but why don't I just do something specific to those two items that were asked about? So let's switch over to the uh, monitor view so that you can see me, how I go about editing. And I'm going to load up a very old picture of my grandson, Nathan. He's now six, but this is back when he was like a year and a half, not even two years old yet. Okay, so here we are in the full version of Lightroom. And as you can see, he sure was a cutie, wasn't he? And this is shot raw. It was shot on an Nikon DSLR. And again, typical of raw files, they are kind of dull. They don't have a full black. They don't have a full white tone, but they sure do have a lot of dynamic range. And so that's what we're going to use here. And the way that I go about doing this, especially not so much for portraits like this, in other words, pictures including people's faces, is really wonderful for landscape. And I'm going to go ahead and give you a quick example of that after I get done with this image right here. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to crop it. And I want to keep the correct ratio. So I'm going to hit R. I'm going to click on my Shift key. And I'm going to crop and that will maintain my aspect ratio. And I want to really cut this out down here. So I'm going to move the image down a little bit right there, just like that. And I want that sort of angular look to his body, like he's actually in motion. In fact, I'm going to tilt it even a little bit more. That adds a little bit of action to the actual image. Now, obviously, if you look at the histogram way over here, you will notice that most of the tones actually exists right around the middle of the histogram as you can see there is no white there is no black so this is what we're going to address i always take my images and i set a white point and a black point and i'm going to use anthony morganti's method and he is on youtube wonderful photographer and an amazing adobe lightroom editor so this i learned from him and it really applies to most of your images not so much for this type but i think it'll work out so here's what you do okay so here's what we are going to do we're going to bring our highlights all the way down it's going to look even duller bring our shadows all the way up really going to look super dull now so now what we have to do, now that we have increased the dynamic range as wide as possible, we're going to go ahead and create a black point and a white point. So we're going to go to the white slider, click on Alt, and I'm sorry, but I don't have a Mac, and so I don't know what the keyboard equivalent would be for Alt, but go ahead, and if you do know how to do that and you're using a Mac, go ahead and click on the equivalent key and then move the slider white to the right. You can see that everything went black. You see right here, the moment that I clicked on the slider, everything went black. And I'm going to slide it toward the right. And you can see areas that are beginning to peek through. See this bluish areas here, right in this area. And you can see the actual warning. I have it set to give me a warning for highlights. You can see that it's showing red. So what we're going to do is bring that down just so it disappears. Do the same thing with the black slider. Move it toward the left until you start to see areas showing up in other words once they start to show up that means that they are beginning to get clipped so you don't want to go too far so right about that point right there and voila now you can see that i have detail all the way to black and i have detail all the way to white on my histogram still most of my tonal range sits around the mid and slightly higher than midpoint area so what we can do now is basically you could either do it on the histogram itself grab an area and move it around. You can see that I can do that. Go all the way to the white. It's gonna push those white points a little bit beyond the clipping point, so we don't wanna do that. Notice right here, my little red warning for clipping, for highlight clipping. So you bring that down like that until there is no clipping either on the black. So you can see there is no clipping on the black. 
or the white. Now we're going to increase the contrast a little bit. Highlights all the way down, max. Shadows all the way up, max. Whites are set. Clarity. Now, clarity will add sharpness to edges. So we're going to go ahead and add just a little bit of clarity and a little bit of a... This is a new filter called Dehaze. Let me show you what it does. Notice that it adds a lot of haze or removes haze. And of course, it looks absolutely horrible on this type of image. So we're going to go ahead and set that to zero. This is used in case you have a landscape of a similar type image that has that hazy look and you want to increase sort of like an x-ray filter that you can see right through the haze. And you just go ahead and apply that filter. So we're going to add a little vibrance. And vibrance will increase the colors that are not related to skin tone. And so the blues here on the Deer Park bottle, the reds, greens on his little shorts, the blue on his little hat have been enhanced. So right now, this is about as far as I want to go at this point. I'm going to slide down. Now, the traditional way to do a contrast curve is to create that S-curve effect. So in black and white printing, in black and white film, you actually wanted to achieve a gamma curve that did this. Kind of an S-curve like that. So it sort of curves, as you can see, like so. And when you do that, you're going to introduce a little bit of the problem on the eyes. But we're going to handle that in a minute. So I'm not worried about that yet. Let me go ahead and fix the black point a little bit and the white point. Okay, so we are good to go. His face is a little dark, but we'll deal with that in a minute. So let me scroll down. Here you can actually affect individual colors or overall saturation change the luminance depending on the actual color. So you can actually select a color and just change the saturation or luminance in that particular color or hue. So let's go ahead and increase the blue. So I'm going to go ahead and choose saturation. I'm going to click on that little dot right here. It says adjust saturation by dragging on the photo. Okay. So as you can see, now I have a funny looking icon and I'm going to go ahead and drag up and down. And notice now his hat is even bluer and I'm going to just set it right about that point. Wow, that's that's pretty graphic. Maybe I overdid it a little bit, but that's just to show you what you can do. Then I'm going to bring down the highlights again, the white point, because it's beginning to clip. You see what I'm saying? So right here on the shirt. It's beginning to clip and I'm all about tonal range and I want to maintain that to the max. So as you make any adjustments, you might go ahead and affect some of those tonal points. So you can also move the histogram by clicking on the most brightest highlight and bring it down. All right. So now I like the way that looks. I'm going to add a little bit of vignetting and at the end, I'm going to go ahead and add some sharpening. But let's go ahead and add a filter that will remove chromatic aberrations depending on the lens that I use. And I went ahead and applied that. That is done. As well as distortion also, by the way. So we're going to add a little bit of a vignette effect. And there we go. Not, nothing this bad. We just want to darken the corners a little bit. That leads your eye toward the center. We're going to actually light up his face in a minute. Yes, it's kind of counterintuitive because we spend lots of money on lenses that have zero vignetting and then we turn around and add vignetting in post. Hey, what can I say? All right. So now that we have achieved everything we want to achieve, we're going to go ahead and do some selecting, dodging and burning. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this little brush tool. And when I bring it over, you can see that it has an inner diameter and then an outer diameter. That is the, the size of the brush and the feather of the brush. In other words, the gradual change from the edge toward the center. Right bracket will increase it. Left bracket will decrease it. And so we're going to go ahead and lighten this side of his face a little bit. So I'm going to go to this side and I'm going to set the exposure beyond, say, 0.1. That means that I'm going to go ahead 
And wherever I apply the brush, I'm going to lighten that area by that amount. Done. Now I'm going to go ahead and unclick, click again. I'm going to use a smaller brush. I'm going to lighten up or dodge this area right here. And you need a lot of feathering so that you remove any possibility of someone looking at it and say, hey, that looks like you did something. So I reclicked on the brush to get out of that mode. I'm going to enlarge the image by just clicking on it. And now I've got to get rid of this. So we're going to go ahead and create a brush that is super small. And I'm going to go ahead and increase the exposure. As you can see, I got rid of most of the problems. We'll get out of the brush. We'll go back. And he has extremely bright blue eyes, even today at age six. So that really enhances that look. I know it looks a little odd to you guys, but believe me, when you print it, it'll just be just beautiful. So that is about all we're going to do. I didn't want to get involved into too much into editing, but this is what I do. Now let's go ahead and choose a quick landscape. Let's see, we were at Great Falls, Virginia, and that is a fabulous place. Oh, here we go. A shot of the falls. Okay, you can see how dull and just boring this looks. So we're going to go ahead and fix that. Now, again, we'll do the same method. Highlights down, shadows up, hit Alt, white point, black point. And already you can see the difference. Now we need to bring this up. We need to make this pop a little bit. So let's take a quick look. Now we have a little bit of clipping on those highlights, but those are kind of specular. So we're not going to worry too much. Well, I'm going to still bring them down so that it's perfectly brought down to that. It should be able to print. It should be able to actually print with a minuscule amount of ink. It will not be just a paper base. I'm going to go directly to the histogram because we are able to access specific areas. You can see that I did not really affect the highlights, but I brought down those shadow tones down a little bit. And now everything's very even, evenly distributed. That's what you want. If it's a normal looking image with a lot of tonal range and evenly distributed tones, you want to be able to create a histogram that looks evenly distributed. If it's a high key photo, most of your tones are going to be on this side, on the bright side. If it's a dark key photo, they're going to be, or low key photo, it's going to be distributed mostly to the dark end of the histogram. But you still need to nail down that white point and that black point that will then assure you you have a complete histogram. Okay, clarity is going to go up and look what happens. It gets a little bit crunchy. Let's go ahead and increase the magnification. This is normal. This is none. It looks almost like you're looking through a foggy piece of glass. This is normal, so we're going to increase it. And something like this, that is a landscape with crisp edges, you can increase clarity quite a bit. No dehaze. I don't need to dehaze this. There was a, not a bit of haze in the sky. So I may just add a little bit just for the heck of it, just to say that I did it. Now on the vibrant side, you can probably crank that up quite a bit and see what happens. Look at the blues of the water. Notice right in this area here. See how everything is enhanced. Look at the colors of the water, the different yellows and greens. So that's a good point. That may look exaggerated to you, but when you print it, it's not going to be that exaggerated because printing always dulls down the look that you have on a monitor. So let's just say that we are satisfied with this for the time being. We're going to apply some sharpness. I did not apply sharpness to Nathan's picture because I don't want him to be that sharp. I don't want him to be crunchy, as I say. So there's a method that you can use. It's called masking. You click on the Alt key and you drag the masking to the right. That will start to include a lot of the minor edges, as you can see here, or start to kind of eliminate those and only concentrate on the actual hard edges of the image. So let's go ahead and set it to about right there, because I don't want to sharpen water. Water is supposed to be flowing and smooth. I want to sharpen the edges of different areas of changing contrast, for instance. Okay, so now we have that. Now I can go ahead and add, probably max out the sharpening. I'll show you what it looked like before. 
This is with zero. You can see this is rather dull, not sharp. So you see what, what you did here is you prevented this from happening. Crunchy. Just zero masking looks crunchy as can be. Everything got sharpened, even areas that you may not want to be sharpened. So this is isolating tonality changes. So areas of contrast changes, edges, things like that. So if you want a little bit more sharpening, then you need to include more areas. So that right here in this area, for instance, here, you can see that when I click, there's some more detail included. But when I go to the right, it just kind of goes away. Areas that are black are just not going to be sharpened. So we want to sharpen just enough of that water churning. So we'll leave it right about that point right here. And now I can go ahead and sharpen to the max. The radius is another adjustment that you can apply. This is the width or how many pixels in and out of an edge will sharpen and be applied. So most people use 1 or 1 1.5. We'll leave it right there. And that looks really good to me. So that'll be a really, really nice sprint. All right, let's go ahead and add. A little bit of saturation we want this to pop a little bit more of course we'll add our chromatic and enable the profile corrections this will get rid of any kind of chromatic aberration or any kind of distortion that my lens introduced and you can see that it actually did introduce some distortion so now it's been taken care of and it tells you what lens you use what camera you use and so forth all right so we're going to add a little vignetting just a tiny amount go back up to the top and now I want to play around with dodging and burning. This is what we did in the darkroom. So I want to darken this rocky outcrop right here. It looks brighter than I think it should be. So I want to darken it somewhat. So I'm going to click on that brush again. Look how tiny my brush is. So I'm going to hit the right bracket key. I'm going to change my adjustments to underexpose a little bit. And I'm going to go over that area. And you can see how it changed. Now once I have that area selected basically, with my brush, I can go ahead and adjust. You can see how seamless that is. Now this matches the density here, pretty much. So I want to darken the bottom of the water, the bottom area, this area right here, I want to darken it a little bit because I want to bring attention to this area here of the falls. So I'm going to get a new brush. I'm not going to darken it that much. I'm going to enlarge it somewhat, right bracket key right about that point and I'm going to cover this whole area I'm going to paint this whole area here and now I'm going to drag the exposure down you can see how that is darkening the area pretty seamlessly it's not going to really show up as a hard edge and it's bringing your attention to the area right here now I can increase the contrast in that region that I basically selected or isolated so you have a lot of different controls here. Contrast. You see how I change the contrast? Well, I don't want to change it that high. I want to leave it a little bit more subtle. Boom, right there like that. Now I want to go ahead and create another brush and hit the back. And what I could do, rather than adjust the exposure too much, saturation. Look what happens. Look what happens to the blue. Very unnatural. So I'm going to go ahead and just add a little bit more density to the blues and the greens in that area there, like so. Maybe I will do the same here in this region here. So basically, I just went over it, and the same application that I previously had was applied to that. So let's just say that we are now done. We're going to head on over to print these two images. So I want to show you how you set up the Canon printer for printing straight out of Lightroom. All right, so we jump over to the print module, which is this tab right here. One, two, three, four, five, the sixth tab to the right. And whatever I had defaulted to before is going to be the one that you will see. So we're going to go ahead and the first thing we're going to do before we do anything at all is jump over to the lower left side of the interface page setup. People get confused that they are doing something twice here and also in the driver. No. When you click on page setup, basically you're going to open your printer driver. And at this point, I have the Pro 1000 series 
chosen. So we're going to switch over to the Pro 100, which is the one that folks were interested in. We're going to do a very simple image print on a letter size paper. So have a look at what I did. Properties. And then we land on this page right here. What we need to do at this point is make sure that photo printing is chosen. Not standard, not business document, not paper saving, but photo printing. When you do that, immediately it's going to default to borderless printing. Undo that. Don't worry about the paper choice or size at this point. Click on color intensity, manual adjustment. This will open up. Click on the matching tab and click on none. OK. You have now performed the act of turning off color matching, which is a must thing that you need to do when you are printing through an application such as Lightroom, Photoshop, QImage, or any of the other color managed applications for printing, editing and printing that is, and you want to use an ICC profile for that particular paper. You cannot allow the driver to control color after you have told these applications to also control color by utilizing an ICC profile. So you have to turn one of them off. It's one or the other, never both. So we have now done that. Let's go ahead and pick a paper. I love my semi-gloss. Standard, no, I like high setting. We're going to pick a letter size and we're going to be feeding the paper through the top tray or the rear tray as they call it. And OK. Boom. So notice nothing changed. It looks basically the same format. I went ahead and applied some exposure lightning on the image because I noticed at this point it was a little bit too dark. So we want it to match on print what you see on your monitor. Otherwise, all that editing that you perform just goes to waste. It's really useless. You, you're not matching what your output is. So, you know, why bother? So the way that we certify your printer is to print a standard image. And that is this one right here. So you print this just simply using the printer driver. You do not use an ICC profile. You open it, tell the printer to use semi-gloss, whatever. As long as it's a Canon paper, print it. And then you're going to have this. You look at it and it looks correct. That just tells you that your printer by itself can print something correctly. It's not too light, it's not too dark. The problems come in when your monitor is not calibrated. Then you start editing your own images and that's when you get into trouble. If your monitor does not match this output and that is your goal in life when it comes to photo printing, your monitor has to be made via calibration to match the unadulterated result of that unadulterated, perfect standard image printed through the driver alone. Once you achieve that, then you can proceed and edit. Because most people's monitors are too bright, too blue, and, and so forth. They're not linearly correct as far as tonality. And so they have to be brought to a condition that allows it to display color values to you correctly. Then you can make that intelligent choice while you're editing which way to go. If your monitor is too bright, you're going to automatically darken your images and they're going to print dark. If your monitor is too dark, you're going to automatically lighten your images and they're going to print too light. If your monitor is too blue, you're going to automatically warm up your images and they will print overly warm and vice versa. So that is the key. The key is to have a monitor that is correctly calibrated so that it matches the output without any help of this image. And you can grab this on my Facebook group. If you haven't joined yet, make sure you look at the video description. Okay. And there will be the link to my Facebook group. Go there. I will accept you immediately or as soon as I, I am able. And then you can go to the files tab and download whatever you wish. Okay, all of the files are there, including that one. All right, let's go back. So here we are ready to print. So here's my lovely boy, Nathan, and we're going to go ahead and set that up on a letter size print. So we are now ready to print this. We are done with all of this up here. We're going to scroll down. So we are printing onto a Canon printer. So here's what you need to do. And by the way, we already set the driver to the correct settings. 
paper choice, no color matching, photo printing, high quality, letter size. So we're done. We are done there. Now we're going to go ahead and set up our color management in Lightroom. So before you do that, we're going to go ahead and set the native resolution. Canon expects to see, which is 300. If it was an Epson printer, we would change it to 360. And that is PPI. Do not confuse that with DPI. Dots per inch is not pixels per inch. This pertains to image resolution. So we want our image, whatever the size it was, to be brought down to 300 pixels per inch and fit within this particular cell size and this particular paper size. So 300 is what we will use for a Canon printer. Print sharpening. This will apply extra print sharpening that it needs. It is called output sharpening. It's some extra sharpening that you will need because what you see on your monitor sharpening wise will not be what you see on paper. Paper has dot gain. In other words, sharp edges will bleed a little bit within that emulsion. So you need to add a little extra sharpness. So we will just choose standard and we're going to be printing on a semi gloss paper. So we're going to choose glossy. There's only two choices, either matte or glossy. So glossy is what we will choose. Color management. Now you can actually choose to let your printer do it or allow the application to do it. So we're going to go to color management. We're going to click on the arrow. Here is your profile. Click and you have a choice at this point. You can check it out and say, oh, I'm going to let the driver do it and go back to the driver. Allow the driver to print it. Lightroom will not interfere in any way. And then go back to the driver, color intensity, manual adjustment, and set that color matching back to standard. So you can do that, but we're not going to do that. We're very brave here. We're going to go ahead and use a ICC profile. And we are looking for semi-gloss, Canon Pro 100 semi-gloss. And it doesn't seem to be here, so we're going to go ahead and click on Other. And this is where we're going to look for the Canon Pro 100 series in semi-gloss. And you will see two profiles. One will have a 1 slash 2, and one will have a number 3. These are quality levels. So we want the best one, the 1 or 2 qualities. We're going to click on that one, click on the little box, and boom, we are done. So at this point, we are ready to print. Oh, but you may want to check to see what it might look like when you print it. So there's such a thing as soft proofing. We're back to the develop module. Click on the S key and make sure that you have the correct profile chosen. Canon Pro 100, 1 slash 2, photo paper semi-gloss. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in. Now this is with soft proofing and without. So you see that it's dropped the saturation a little bit. This is what it's going to look like on my monitor. And this is what it's going to look like when I print it. Now you can create a copy of that and then edit that while still under soft proofing mode and increase the saturation a little bit to compensate for that and then print that particular copy. It gets very, very involved. I recommend that you just go ahead and print it without soft proofing at this point until you get really used to the process. And that will give you a little bit more um, versatility in your complete process. The same thing with the shot of the falls. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in. I'm going to hit the S key and notice how it dulls it down. Now, this is a little bit exaggerated in a way. It's not going to really be that much of a change when you see it on paper. So you have to kind of be a little bit careful when you start soft proofing. Make sure that your monitor is correctly calibrated. That's very important when you soft proof. So this is without soft proofing. This is the way the monitor is displaying it and with soft proof. So again, I would just go ahead and print it and then compare it back to the monitor to see where you need to make any adjustments. And if you have any drastic adjustments to make, that means your monitor wasn't calibrated correctly to begin with. All right, so that is about it. Now that we have the profile pick, we have turned off color management in the driver, color intensity manual adjustment, matching set to none. We have the right paper chosen, semi-gloss, high quality, letter size, that is now all set. 
All we have to do then here in Lightroom is to make sure that our resolution is at 300 for a Canon. You've done your layout to your liking, standard sharpening, glossy because it's semi-gloss, correct profile. Now you get to pick the relative or perceptual rendering intent. So that is it. Click print and it will go ahead and print. All right, folks, I hope that wasn't too confusing. It can be. And basically all you need to do is perform your edits the way you like them. If you came from the darkroom world, a lot of the terminology and steps that you will be performing will sort of refresh your memory. You will remember, oh yeah, I used to do this. I used to do that. So get your edits the way you want them. Make sure your monitor is calibrated properly so that it matches an untampered print of this image. Then set your driver to no color matching if it's a Canon driver or no color management or no color adjustment on an Epson driver. And then go over to the print module, set up your print size, set up your cell size that's independent of the paper size. So keep that in mind. Set up your resolution, your output sharpening. Resolution is 300 pixels per inch for Canon. 360 pixels per inch for Epson, okay? Sharpening, glossy or matte. Pick your profile. If you do not see it listed, hit other, and then locate it manually. Click on the little box. That way it'll be saved for the next time you want to print using that combination of paper and printer. And so then you just proceed and print. And that is it. As long as all of the other parameters are set, your print, should be a very close match to your monitor. Keep in mind the monitor is always going to be brighter, more slightly more color saturation, richness, and so forth. It's not going to match image created with inks on paper. Paper is just dull in comparison to a backlit monitor. So you have to keep that in mind. Don't lose sleep over this, folks. Again, if you have to make slight adjustments, Go ahead and do so. If you got to make huge adjustments, that means your monitor really needs to be recalibrated. All right, that is it. I hope you enjoyed this rather longish video, but again, it was a request by some viewers, and so I felt the need to produce something that is going to be a little bit more detailed than most other types of Lightroom videos. So that is it. Thank you so much. Don't forget to subscribe, share, and like. Check the description of the video. Below, we will find all of the links to my services and other links that I share for supplies and things like that. So thank you so much and happy printing, everybody. Bye-bye.